Welcome to HopeYourMath.com. In today's video, we're going to be talking about problem one for the review for the statistics exam. Now, here we have hypothesis testing. And here we have a researcher claims that 86% of college graduates say their college degree has been a good investment. In a random sample of 1,000 graduates, 845 say their college degree has been a good investment. At a significance level of 10%, is there enough evidence to reject the researcher's claim? Now here we see we have a lot of information. So let's start by highlighting what's important in this problem. And here we notice firstly, we have to identify our claim, right? So our first thing to do is identify the claim. And our claim is, um, our claim says, and we see here a researcher claims that 86% of college graduates say their college degree has been a good investment. And that percentage is going to be represented by the P. And P stands for the proportion, which is a percentage usually. And this is going to be 86%. So the reason why this has equality is because they claim that 86% of college graduates say their college degree has been a good investment. This is specifically for 86%. So we set the claim equal to 86%, which turns out to be 0 0.86. Now, whenever we have a claim, there's a certain format that we have to follow as far as hypothesis testing goes. For instance, our alternative and null hypothesis, this is the null hypothesis. And HA will be the alternative. And right here, I'm just going to add the type of test it is. So here, when, whenever we see an equality, any symbol of equality will become a null hypothesis. So the three symbols for equality are either less than or equal, equal, or greater than or equal. The counter argument to each of these for less than or equal to would be greater than. For, not e for equal would be not equal and for greater or equal than is less than. Now a good way to see how this works is let's think of something very basic uh, a lot of college students may know about. So to go out and party you have to be 21 years or older, right? So to get into a club you have to be older or 21 and who can't get into the club? Anybody under 21 years of age, right? So Here's a good understanding of how the counter arguments work. If someone's 21 and over, they can go in. Anybody under 21 cannot. These are perfectly counter arguments. And that's why we see the opposites are usually the other sign without the, the equality symbol in them. Now, for equals, not equals is very easy to see as to why it's the counter argument. If somebody says it's raining outside, the counter argument, it's not raining outside. Now, anytime you see on the alternative hypothesis, a right, not equal, or a left, this determines the type of test you're going to conduct for your hypothesis test. So if we have a greater than symbol for the alternative, this is a right tail test. When we see not equal, this is a two tail test. And when we see the less than symbol on the alternative, we know it's a left tail test. In our case here, we have the claim says the p-value, the proportion, is 0 0.86. So this becomes our null hypothesis. So we have p is equal to 0 0.86. Our alternative hypothesis, the counterargument, will say the proportion is not 0 0.86, right? So there we have our first three steps to this hypothesis test. And we have our claim, we have our null hypothesis, which is generated from the claim, and our alternative hypothesis, which is also generated from the claim with using this table. Make sure you make a note of this. This will help you through all your hypothesis testing. Now that we have the first three steps, we're going to move on to the fourth step, which is identify the rejection region using the significance level. And to see that, we can look for the significance level on this table. As we see here, alpha is 0 0.10. So here, this is telling us that our significance level is 0 0.10. And since we know the tail of a test, right, it's a two-tail test, we'll draw a diagram to represent 
where we have a rejection region and where we won't, right? So here's our normal distribution table because this is a p-value. And alpha is 0 0.10. So when we divide alpha by 2, we get 0 0.05. And this represents the area in each tail because there's two tails to this test, right? Here's one tail, here's the other tail. Now, we know from this significance level, which is generated by doing 1 minus the confidence level, which gives us alpha, and we have the value of alpha is 0 0.10. 1 take away the confidence level will give us the significance level. So here we can easily see that the confidence level is 90%. By looking on your z-score charts in the bottom right corner, you should see a little chart with three specific values. One says 0 0.90, 0 0.95, and 0 0.99, all three of them. Next to them are corresponding critical z-values. The critical z-values for 0 0.99 are 2.575, for 0 0.95 is 1.96, and for 0 0.90 it's 1.645. So here our alpha, because of our confidence level of 0 0.90, gives us our critical z-values. So on this side it's negative 1.645, that's the critical z absolute value of it is 1.645. On the left-hand side, it's negative. On the right-hand side, it's positive. And in the middle here, we have the 90%. So over here, we have the 0 0.05. Over here, we have the 0 0.05. Now, the way this works, and in the middle here, we have 0 0.90. The way this will work, then, is if our z-score falls out here on the ends above 1.645 or below negative 1.645, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If it lands in the middle, we're going to fail to reject. All right, that means it has to fall between negative 1.645 and 1.645. So now, since we have our critical region, let's notarize our z critical value. So our z critical will become plus and minus 1.645. So now we have to calculate our z-test statistic because we have our rejection regions and our z-critical value. So we're going to get our test statistic to see if our test statistic falls between these two values. If it falls between, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. If it falls above or below the negative and positive of these, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So let's calculate that z-test statistic then. So our z-test stat. To calculate the z-test stat, we're going to need to notarize the rest of our details. So what do we know about this problem? We have 86% is our p, right? Our p-value is 0 0.86, so we're going to need a q. To get q, we do 1 minus p, and p is 0 0.86. This makes 0 0.14. Besides p and q, we're also going to need, because our formula for the test statistic is p hat minus p over the square root of p times q over n. So here our n is our, our number of samples. And here we see the 1,000 graduates are our n, right? So here we have 1,000. Our x, to make p hat, p hat is the value x divided by n. So to make the p hat, we also need the x. And x is the 845 college students who say their degree has been a good investment. So we have here 845. So then we have the p hat is x over n, which is 845 divided by 1,000. And this is 0 0.845. So there's our p hat. We have everything we need to calculate this now. right? So besides this, we will need a calculator and a z-score chart. right? And make sure you have both of those handy because it's going to be really important the way you calculate this, all right? It's a little bit of a tricky situation. Make sure you have a good uh, scientific calculator or a TI calculator to do this. So I'm going to abbreviate this test that to TS. So we have Z of TS equals the P hat, which is 0 0.845 minus 0 0.86 divided by the square root of 0 0.86, our p-value, times our q-value of 0 0.14, divided by 
1,000. Now be careful when you're doing this because you should have all these values in parentheses and a square root outside of it on your calculator, all right? Best way to do this, do the top and then do the bottom, then divide the top with the bottom using the answer and key on your calculator, right? So when we do this difference on top, we're going to get the ZTS equals negative 0 0.015, right? After we get that value, we're going to do everything in here and leave it in the square root. And when we do that, we're doing 0.86 times 0.14, which is just about 0.0012, and we divide that by 1,000. We're going to get 0 0.0000012. All right? And now when we take the square root of this, and while we're dividing, we divide this by this and the square root. We should get negative 1.3. 6 and 7. We want to keep at least three decimal places when doing this because we have to round this to the second position. When we round this, we get a z of negative 1.37. Based on this z-score alone, our test statistic, negative 1.37 is going to fall between these two numbers, which is right here. So based on this score, we can determine that we fail to reject this null hypothesis because we see it falls in the fail to reject region. However, if you had to do the p-value as well, I'll show you what you need to do. In this case, it's a two-tailed test, the only test in which you have to multiply your p-value by two. We have to take our test statistic and generate the area from the z-score that this generates. Usually, if you have a negative, you calculate to the left. If you have a positive, you calculate to the right, meaning you have to do 1 minus if it's on the right side. In this case, we don't have to worry about that. So our p-value is going to be 2 times the probability of z is less than negative 1.37. And this is the part where we need our z-score charts, right? So we're looking up the z-score for negative 1.37, and our z-score for negative 1.37 is going to be 0 0.0853. And when we multiply these two, we get... 0 0.1706. So our p-value here is 17.06% or just 0 .01, 0 0.1706. So to reject or accept the null hypothesis, we have to compare the p-value to the alpha. And if your p-value is greater than alpha, you, you have to fail to reject the null hypothesis. In this case, our p-value is greater than the null hypothesis, so we must fail to reject the null hypothesis. Thank you.